are all welcome. We'll just run through and we'll begin our program and just go, we'll just continue while we are waiting for others and be carrying. Hopefully, they will join sooner. They say, as we all know, there is nothing we can do without starting with God. Everything should be with God. And no, even the knowledge we have, everything we want to talk about here, every impact will be felt only if God indeed honors what we are saying. In, even though we have learned it, we have studied in school, experienced, the doctors have experience from the hospital, but without the hand of God interfering in it all, uh, the, whole, the whole project will not even be where we are now. Even the network I'm interfering, but we know that once we call the presence of God, we, everything is going to be smooth. So we'll just pray for two, one minute. Our God and Father, that we thank you for this hour which you have brought us to learn and be equipped with that which you have taught your children. Faithful God, we call you to be in our midst and to enlighten us that we will not be distracted in any way. And the internet connection, oh Lord God, will be smooth and flow through even as we get knowledge that you have prepared for us today. May your name be glorified in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So to begin, I'll just give a short summary of what the talk will be all about today. Just some short summary for us to know what we are here for, what, what we are going to benefit, what we are going to be impacted with. Okay, so the, the this project is titled Awareness on Preconception, Preconception Care Among, among Women of reproductive age. Awareness on preconception care among women of reproductive age. So in this talk, we'll be talking about what every woman needs to know before getting pregnant, before you want to think of getting pregnant. I mean, for those here that have had uh, experience in pregnancy, you will know that most of us just get to know that, oh, once you get married, you have to meet with your spouse and you get pregnant. We don't even think about preparing ourselves. And very soon, the next minute, we start going to the hospital or oh, we complain left and right, that's giving, oh, doctor, it's been two years I got married. Meanwhile, we did not even prepare ourselves. We did not even, I mean, it has a lot, there are a lot of things. It's not just some, some chance game or some magic we are playing. We have to be prepared for us to, to, I mean, it's a new something you, are, you want to introduce your system to. That means you have to get your system prepared to be able to have this tool, to welcome this thing and be ready to, to get this new thing called pregnancy. Now, the second thing is how to have a healthy pregnancy. Oh my God. I, I, I for one, I can talk a lot about this because from, I mean, for a, from a layman point of view, because before... I mean, now, before like a year or two, I thought that it was just a normal thing to, to, to get pregnant and have a safe delivery and everything. But with the, the, people I've, uh, the people I've met, with the challenges I've seen, with those I interacted, I've been interacting with, I know that, trust me, we definitely need such a powerful educational moment to know how to carry through, even when you have you have been blessed with this pregnancy. We have to be able to learn how to carry this pregnancy through, to have a healthy pregnancy. The child's health, health and even the mother's health, it's, it's a very critical moment that without this knowledge, we find ourselves just not having the best out of this beautiful experience. And also, we'll be, talk, we'll be, we'll be learning on how to increase our chance of getting pregnant. What are the things that can be done? What can we do to increase this chance? Not just leave it a lock, lock matter and all that. It's, it's an opportunity for us to learn this. And finally, how to plan our pregnancy and prevent unwanted pregnancy. Oh, I will just ship in something here. Just imagine you get, you, 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 you just have a baby now. Two months later, you find yourself pregnant. <laughs> it's the most challenging thing you can imagine. First, it prevents the other, the little baby, and you and everything. It becomes so. This, this, this project is going to teach us. This talk today is going to teach us how we can prevent this 
unwanted pregnancy and actually plan our pregnancy, not just leave pregnancy to chance. It, it will be a matter of you, you you plan it if it's something that you you put you and your spouse you actually sit and coordinate yourself and not just boom find yourself unprepared in pregnancies so that's that's the that's those are the things we will be learning today it will be such a powerful i mean not just for you as an individual but for many many others that will be that will, will, will get to share what we learn from learn with learn today with them so to begin we'll have our we'll have to call so that we don't i mean so that we, we start enjoying the lesson already i would like to introduce the powerhouse of this program the person that made under her canopy under her her, her her whole canopy to bring forth this program so that she can start off and tell us what we are tell us something about the whole the whole the whole project and how it's going to go about to begin i will just tell you first who she is and what she's made of her name is dr wanyama noel ambosa she's a medical doctor at the bamenda regional hospital she's a founder and ceo of talk pregnancy with dr noela which has as objective to improve the health of women children adolescents she has a great passion for pregnant women and also has great knowledge in dealing with these women. She loves to give back, especially to girls and women, through her numerous educative health talks and health campaigns. She just finished her course on global public health and is set to implement what she had acquired. So we call on Dr. Nuela to give us an introduction on this whole talk and how it's going to on what we are going to beginning so going as we go on dr noela it's really my Ooh. honor to be here and i'm so glad to have you all here so it's it has been a long awaited project which I think it's good for all of us to know what this is all about. I'm Dr. Nguaya Manuela. She introduced me all, so I'm not going to go into that any longer. So this is actually a project um, in collaboration with female and more organization in Nigeria, where we are bringing out projects on girls, on girls, anything concerning girls, about girls' education, sexual and reproductive health rights. So it's very important now today we chose this topic, awareness on preconception care, which is a strategy to improve pregnancy outcome and prevent mother and child death. So this is what this project is all about. But before we want to start talking about all this, we have a small assignment that we have to give everyone that you're going to answer. It's just a five minutes thing you're going to just answer them quickly. So we know your conception about this preconception care, your knowledge, what you know about preconception care before we get into the matter. So I'm going to send the link. And when you answer it, you're going to see your score. You're going to see maybe like how many, how many do you have on six and all that. So you're going to test your knowledge to see how what you know about this. Then after at the end, we are also going to have like a poster. Okay, what is this project all about? So the aim, the aim of this project is to increase awareness on preconception care, which is a strategy to improve pregnancy outcome among women in their reproductive age group. And when we talk about reproductive age group, it is from 15 years to 45 years of age. We know that at least by 15 years of age, you should already be, majority of girls should be having their menses. Then by 48, by 45 years, we should be expecting that you are almost finishing with conception for you trying to get pregnant. So that is the reproductive age group. Now, what is the problem? What are we trying to solve here? 
That's the sustainable development goal, which ensure well-being for all. It targets the to reduce maternal mortality to less than 70 deaths per 1,000 live births. What do we mean by this? What do we mean by this? It means that in order to reduce maternal mortality, and maternal mortality means a woman who dies due to pregnancy, be it during the pregnancy or even after, but related to the complications caused by pregnancy. So we are targeting this sustainable development goal is targeting that women who have to die during that process should be less than 70 in every 100,000 live births. So in Cameroon, what do we have? The maternal mortality ratio as of 2018 is at 467. So you see that we still have a long way to go in Cameroon. So, and even getting this 70% is not, 70 death is not easy. So much has to be done. So even the little you can do is still very, very important. Now, what does the WHO recommend? It recommends that all women should have equal and timely access to reproductive health services before, during, and after pregnancy. Therefore, preconception care has to be placed on the lamb light. Why do we have to place it on the lamb light? Once you know what you can do during pregnancy and even after pregnancy, it saves you that stress while you are there during the pregnancy. You're confused once you're pregnant. Maybe you don't know your body has to change. You don't know you can have your blood pressure might go up. You don't know you can have chest pain. You don't know you have some conditions and maybe it can aggravate during pregnancy. Now, once you get pregnant, those things start surprising you. Why? Because you did not prepare for it. So once you prepare for this, once these complications are occurring, you are already aware and immediate management can be taken into place. So we need to put this on the limelight. Many pregnancies are unplanned and often end up unfavorable. Example, frequent miscarriages. You will see a woman coming to consult. Doctor, I've had miscarriages. This is the third miscarriage. I don't know what's happening. But if she could have gone for this preconception care, this could have not even happened or they would have found a way to prevent this from happening. They would have seen maybe an infection, for example, they screen it, they might check and see an infection. And then they manage this infection. And you will not even discover that you could have been having some frequent miscarriages. So it saves you from that stress. Now, ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy, you can even have an ectopic pregnancy as early as four months of four weeks of pregnancy. Talk less of when you want to miss your period. Sometimes it's even four weeks from the next period. And we can say six weeks, that's when you go and be doing your pregnancy test, when maybe you might already have an ectopic pregnancy. And by the time you want to even think of saying, let me go and start antenatal cleaning, most of us, most women, they go, they say, hey, I don't want to start on the first month. I don't want to start antenatal cleaning. I want to wait for the fourth month before I do this. By the time you are going, it is already ruptured, for example. So with all this, you can prevent all this catastrophe. Now, so many pregnancies are unplanned and often end up unfavorable. So we don't want this unfavorable ending for any woman. Now, what is preconception care? The provision of biomedical, behavioral, and social health interventions which are given to women and couples before they get married. Biomedical, if you have a medical condition, we treat. Behavioral, if you have to gain an appropriate weight before getting pregnant, we tell you what to do. Social, if you have a problem at home, for example, violence, that can be addressed. So all these things are tackled 
because pregnancy like this is very, very complicated. You can see everything going on smoothly. At the end, it turns to something different, which I mean, you not believe it. So it's very, very important. Every woman takes this into consideration. Now, this will identify diseases which were dormant. For example, you have high blood pressure. You will not sit and think that I have high blood pressure. It's when you go and you measure your blood pressure and you see that it is high. Diabetes, it's also the same. Most of the times, they usually present with symptoms when it is already at the terminal stage, where, if, for example, you have stroke or you start having kidney failures, you start discovering that you had maybe high blood pressure, you had diabetes. So, and cases that you already have, if you're hypertensive and you want to get pregnant, you have to go and you check to see that are these medications which I'm taking compatible with pregnancy so that they might change this treatment. So it is very important, this preconception came. Now, this serves as a gateway to a healthy pregnancy. Now, when we talk of healthy pregnancies, when you have to come, you say you want to get pregnant, for example, in the next six months, in the next one year, in the next two years or five years, you want to get pregnant. Now, we are going to advise you, once you get pregnant, these are the number of antenatal consultations you have to attend. So maybe by that time, someone might not tell you about that, but you have already heard about it. And you need to know that you have to attend these antenatal consultations during the first trimester, second and third trimester with the number of frequencies. But you see most people tend to come for these antenatal consultations when they are four or five months pregnant. So it's very important once we tell them about this. So at the end, we see that the number of antenatal consultations too have to increase. So with the preconception care, it's like a gateway to all, to increase all the other forms which are put in place to prevent this uh, maternal mortality. Postpartum counseling, you're also told about it. You know now that after you deliver, I need to still go for consultations. Premarital screening, this is something is just the same like premarital screening. Once they test for uh, maybe sickle cell, for example, and they discover that you have your, your blood types, your genotypes are not correct, you will see that they'll advise you not to get married. So with this, it already prevents you from some um, pre-existing things that could have happened if you did not do it. So it's the same thing, infertility. You will see a woman trying to get pregnant one month, two months, three months, especially people with far relationship. You don't know about your menstrual cycle. You don't know how to calculate it. And by the time the man is coming, they always do the plan. This thing, once they come, you don't know when is your fertile date and you come after ovulation. Even you have um, intercourse as five times per day. Once the ovulation day has passed, it has passed. So you see that you get into trauma, saying you cannot get pregnant. What is happening? So it is very important. So you, you try to remove that trauma, which could have happened. Now, what our perspective? Our perspective is to reach out to 500 women. We are a lot of women here. So many of us, as we finish this, we have to educate at least five other women. And this is going to be evaluated in the WhatsApp group, how you have evaluated those other women and you have to give back reports to us. So that we'll know that it's not only for you, we need other women to hear this and we cannot do it to all the 5,000 or all the women out there. No, we need just a few to be ambassadors. So we are using you as the ambassadors to go out and spread the news to other women. Thank you so, so much for the wonderful insights which you have given. I already learned so much. I feel like I should just close my book and continue. So uh, the other moderator will be introducing the next. Some of the key questions that some of the key questions that are asked. And then later on in the second part, the management part, the counseling part, we'll tell you how each of these questions that we ask are important. 
So we'll ask, we'll get the identification of the couple, the name, the age, the occupation, the address, their religious background, and anything that can help us identify the person and the couple. We'll ask for the woman, her menstrual history. At what age did you first have your menses? How is your, um, your cycle? How many days do you bleed? Has it changed since then or recently? How was the duration of your period? Has your menses changed in color, in aspect, in order, in quantity? All that is important and you will be asked those questions. It is imperative for us to have uh, accurate answers, not to be ashamed because at the end, the objective is for us to have increased chances of getting pregnant, to have a healthy pregnancy and they have a healthy pregnancy outcome. And that outcome is not just the mother, I also at the father and the baby. So we'll ask about your sexual history. When was the first, first time you had sex? At what age was it? Mind you, we usually ask that, but we usually forget some women who may have been raped at earlier ages. So they may come and tell us they had their first intercourse at the age of 21, whereas there was a history of rape at maybe five. It is important in your sexual life, in your reproductive life. So we ask these questions. The number of partners that you have presently. Do you have uh, frequent sexual intercourse? At what frequency? How many times a week? Do you have uh, sexual intercourse freely at any time or you do targeted sexual intercourse? Do you use contraceptive devices or not? Do you have protected sex or unprotected sex? It, it will help us if we have to improve your chance of getting pregnant. Remember, we are trying to look what are the potential problems? What are the potential setbacks we may have? What are the problems that are already there so that we can counsel on how to advise to avoid some and treat the ones that are present all so that we have increased chances of getting pregnant. We will ask in your desire to conceive, has it been for long or it is you will soon want to conceive or you have been wanting to conceive for very long? If it's for very long, have you consulted before? Have you had lab tests? Have you had treatments? What, was, what has been the evolution? Have you been pregnant before? What, are, what were the outcomes of those pregnancies? Did you have an abortion? Were you operated upon? Did you have a cesarean section? Have you had histories of repeated pregnancy losses like, um, early abortions where do you did you have any complications like placenta previa bleeding on pregnancy towards the end of the pregnancy your did you have a past history of sexually transmitted infections chlamydia gonorrhea syphilis the very big names the common names have you ever had it have you ever had symptoms which may, may make you think that you have had such an infection before, but you were not treated or you did, you did you use traditional medications or were you treated at all? Which, which one was it specifically? Were you treated with your spouse? Have you done a control since then? Do you have any other chronic illnesses? Uh, Dr. Nella spoke of hypertension, diabetes, others like epilepsy, others like depression, asthma, any other past history that you have, will have to know because at the end of the day, it may affect your chance of getting pregnant. It may affect your, your, your pregnancy when you even get pregnant and your pregnancy may affect the control of some of those diseases. So we need to know so that we make sure that at the end, everybody, everybody is uh, doing fine. So do we want to know, do you take any recreation? drugs like cocaine, marijuana, with crisis and stress and everything. Some people take some of these drugs, but we need to know now that we want to get pregnant, we're getting into serious business. We need to know because they may affect your pregnancy. We need to know if you're smoking actively or if somebody is smoking beside you. Or are you in an environment where people smoke constantly, like working in a snack bar or working in a restaurant where people are allowed to smoke and you're exposed to smoke? Environmental exposure to some other uh, disturbing substances? Are you living or working in a company where you deal with toxic substances? Are you exposed constantly? How is your, your diet? Do you eat a balanced diet? Do you manage in life such that at the end of the day, we're not sure of how balanced your diet is? We need to know so that we we'll advise on all these things. Do you do exercises at all or never or too much? Are you an athlete? Are you, a, are you a somebody who is banned from being physical exercise? We need to know so that will help you to, because there are some conditions like being overweight, for example, not doing sports and being overweight, that can make you have a hard time conceiving. So we need to know all that. Do you, is there a family history or a past history for yourself 
of delivering children with neural tube defects, those babies who are born with uh, wounds in their backs, let me put it that way, spina bifida or any other genetic problem. Is there any malformation that any of your sisters or yourself have delivered and the child was seen to be born with it? We need to know because some of them are recurrent. Some of them can be prevented. And we need to be sure that if we're engaging into another pregnancy, into a pregnancy, we're making sure that this do does not happen again. We need to know about your partner. Who is he? What's his age? Is it uh, is he in a is is he trying to get pregnant for the first time or does he have any children before? Has he had consultations for wanting to have a child before? What were the findings? Was he on any treatment? We need to know. Then when we finish all this police investigation, when we finish asking you whole lots of questions, and mind you, your answers will push us to more questions. We need now to do an examination and a a series of tests, a series of tests, not because you're sick, but because we are trying to make sure that we have a clean environment that is favorable for conception for both you and your partner, which is why you, you both should come together. But it doesn't mean that if your husband says that I'll only be available next week, you 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 will not come. You can come, but ideally it's for the couple. So we will test you, we will test you for common things which are common setbacks to conceiving in our setting, we will test for sexually transmitted infections, syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, we will check, we will take swabs from your genital tract and check if there are any germs there. We will check your hormones, we will check the hormones involved in reproduction, what are the levels, we will check your blood, what is your full blood count like, are there any problems, are you anemic, is your defense system too weak? We we'll have to check, they'll do your echographies. We need to check what's, how is your genital tract, the womb where the baby stays, the tubes, the ovaries that produce the eggs for you to be pregnant, how are they? We need to check all of that. When we do that now at the end, we make a kind of small summary, a risk assessment. We have a couple, Mr. and Mrs. X, they are, they, they are aged 20, uh, let me say 13 years and 57 years for the wife and the husband. They are wanting to conceive. This is the first time, or oh, yes, this is the first time. The husband has never been a father before. He has been married before, but no children. Like we try to make a small snapshot of who we have in front of us because the management will depend on what our findings are. So when we get the results now of our risk assessment and we end up with the conclusion that, okay, this couple, they don't really have problems with conceiving, but because there is a past history of having a child with a tube defect, we need to put this woman on prophylaxis, that's prevention tablets that would we take in our book that will do this for this particular woman. Because all women are not the same. Each couple is has its own package and its own care, its own findings and its own care. So when we have that summary of who we have in front of us, and what we want to do, what we think should be done. If there is a disease that we have had on the results of the lab tests that we have done, we know that we have to treat those diseases. If we have histories of things that can be recurring, we have to make sure that we advise you how to prevent it. If we have chronic diseases that can affect your pregnancy or your conception, or your pregnancy can even affect it, it's needless having somebody with heart failure and letting them get pregnant so that they die faster all in the name of getting pregnant without controlling the heart failure. You'll be sending you to your grave and you will not have a child, will not have a mother, will have a father who is a widower. That's not what we want. So when we have at the end that summary, what do we do? We'll go down to the second part of preconception care, which deals with counseling or management as a whole. The, the management will depend on the findings, as we said earlier. Now let's go through some of those questions again and see how we can, what we mean. The, the ideal conception age, the ideal age to get pregnant is before the age of 35, ideally, ideally before 35. Not that after 35 you cannot conceive, but your chances start getting slimmer. We start having more and more difficulties. But now, if you have somebody who is wanting to get pregnant at the age of 12 years old, it's not the same approach like somebody who wants to get pregnant at the age of 22. The, the girl at 12, she wants to get pregnant, yes, she may have seen her menses, yes, but she's, her genital tract is immature. Can she have pregnancy? Can she be able to carry a healthy pregnancy till the end? So we will advise her. The mama, the ideal age is between 
at least be 15 years. When it's too early, it's a threat to your life. So that's how we advise her maybe to hold on a bit to counsel the husband that Papa, it is true, you're old or you want to have a child suddenly, but we advise you to wait a little because your wife is still very pregnant and such. If the woman is above 35 years, we start telling her that, Mama, please don't waste too much time again. No. You are telling us that you want to conceive in the next three or five years when you must have secured a big house and blah, 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 blah. Please hurry up because after that, we start having reduced chances and it starts getting very difficult. But then we will not discourage you because with advanced technologies, there is room for as assisted uh, procreation. We'll also be telling that, okay, as you're wasting time and time is going, or as you're trying to conceive and it's not coming immediately, don't bother. We may still resort to assisted procreation. You are working in Sonara company, for example, not to not to uh, do bad publicity. It's just a, a, an example, and you are exposed constantly to heavy uh, patrols or heavy this. It is not good before conception. It is not even good for pregnancy. We we'll advise you to see your 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 administration, if they can change your working post, if they can give you a temporary, uh, I don't know, a break or something. So those are called ideas. Now your weight, your, your diet, your weight, will use your, your parameters to calculate what they call your body mass index. Ideally, you should have your, an ideal body weight. There's a way to calculate it using your height and your weight. Everybody has a body mass index. Now it should be ideal at conception. and. We know that with pregnancy, you will have to uh, gain about nine to 12 kilograms. It means that we, don't, we will not be very happy or comfortable if you're already obese or what they call morbidly obese before you conceive because pregnancy will come at its own weight. Your heart will have too much to carry, your lungs, your, your, your liver, every organ of your body will be stressed. So we may advise you to see a dietitian, see a sports coach, so that we reduce your weight and bring it ideal before you conceive. So those are the, some of the things we can do during counseling. Now for sexual exposure, very important. It is, not, it is no longer recommended to have targeted sexual intercourse when we are trying to conceive. It's very important. We are not saying that it is absolutely bad and it's not working. But when you tell yourself that you or your partner and you decide that you will have sex when you think you're on your fatal period, unknowingly, you put the couple at a certain level of stress. Stress is not good for conception. And then because you are waiting to target, that, that stress that you may even impose on yourself or any other thing that comes and and destabilizes you has an, an impact on your cycle. The least stress, whether you're happy or you're very sad or you are change of environment or whatever can affect your cycle, meaning that you can miss the calculation of your fertile period. And then that's how you keep on stressing and you're having targeted sexual intercourse and you are not getting pregnant. So ideally, a couple trying to get pregnant should have regular, unprotected, untargeted sexual intercourse, not targeting, have free sex, enjoy it, and at the end you will have a smiley baby being conceived. Then the next aspect is uh, uh, coming back to your, co your previous consultations for trying to conceive and the managements you have had. From there, we will know what to, what to uh, in what to tell you again, what to repeat, what not to do, like so that we should not waste your time, we should not waste precious time that we don't have since you're trying to conceive. Or we have ample time to do this or that if you're trying to conceive, maybe in two, three years. But it's good that we have an idea of what you have done before concerning wanting to conceive. Again, it's imperative that preconception uh, pre consultation or follow-up is done for everyone, especially those wanting to conceive. Meaning that what you must not come for preconception care only when you, you absolutely want to conceive in one week's time. It's for everybody at any time, all women of reproductive age, all couples of reproductive age, you come. And if you have a past history of neural tube defects, it is absolutely necessary for you to have a preconception care. I repeat, neural tube defects are those babies who are born with kind of wounds in their back on their vertebral column. They usually call it spina bifida or any problems with the nervous system. It's something that is usually due to deficiencies in some micronutrients like that they call folic acid. If you don't come, we will not know and then you will find you pregnant already, not having prevented some of these things that are recurring. 
Normally, any woman before conception should be on folic acid, ideally, a certain dose. But a woman who has had a, prior, a past issue of delivering a child with neural tube defects must be on folic acid. They must be at a certain quantity that the provider will give you every day, at least three months before you conceive, you should be, and then all through your first trimester, you should be on folic acid at a certain dose. It is imperative. For that one, we don't joke. So we are begging you people, if you know anybody in the quarters who has delivered any child and they have wounds on their back or they have caught spina bifida, ask them before they want to conceive again, they have to come to the hospital and they should not forget to tell that they had a child like that so that we know how to prevent it in the next pregnancy. It is very disabling. It may even make the baby not to be able to walk or stand at all in his whole life. We also... A dietitian can take rendezvous for you, but it's ideal that you you see such a, a, a specialist so that we have increased chances of getting pregnant. We should not have problems with overweight. Overweight is a serious problem to consultation, and we are there. We can help you, but you don't come and we don't know. And we only see you when you're already in your 50s, overweight, obese, and you're still trying to conceive. Whereas we could have prevented it if you had come. We would have simply advised you that, Mama. You have come within that there is nothing, but you should lose a bit of weight, you know. So we also have to uh, see you if in the course of investigations, we have any problems with your lab test or your echographies or whatever screening test we have done, like multiple fibroids. We Usually women who don't conceive early, who conceive a little bit late, maybe around their thirties or thirty-fives, they usually have fibroids because nature hates emptiness. When you don't deliver, the uterus, the womb that carries the baby will find a way of having its own children without you. So you start having fibroids everywhere. And those fibroids come and occupy space where the baby has to stay. That's how conceiving is a problem. You conceive, you're having early abortions before you even know. You, you are already bleeding. You think it's your menses, whereas it's an abortion. And you want to see many years have passed and you're not getting pregnant. So we need to we'll identify some of these problems that need surgeries before you conceive. We'll also offer the surgeries removing fibroids, removing growths in the womb, we'll, we'll offer you those surgeries before you conceive because we are trying to improve your chance of conceiving and to make sure that when you even conceive, your pregnancy goes inch free. So we also talk of having, talk, having to manage uh, chronic diseases like hypertension. In hypertension, there are many drugs that you use to control. Now, some of these drugs are contraindicated in pregnancy. We will not start listing the drugs so that you don't try to become automatic doctors in the quarters because we can cause harm. It's not our goal. We are trying to make sure that every couple has its best chance to conceive and then go through the pregnancy uh, freely without any problem. So some of these drugs are not good for pregnancy. When you want to conceive and you come for preconception care, they will ask you, you have high blood. Okay. On which drugs are you? Are these drugs compatible with pregnancy? Can we continue these drugs or we can change? Can we change to better drugs that are rated in pregnancy? That's what we do. Diabetes. We need to be sure that your diabetes is controlled so that we don't have problems for you. We don't have problems for you conceiving. We don't have problems uh, uh, having the pregnancy to the end. We don't have problems with uh, deliveries because the babies are big. We don't have malformations because there were diabetes that was not uh, controlled. So control your, your glycemia, your sugar level before you get pregnant. Ideally, that's how it's supposed to be. If you have problems like epilepsy, there are some drugs that are used to control it, which are not compatible with pregnancy. We'll try to modify your drugs. If you have problems like depression, a very serious mental health condition, which is overlooked in our communities, but many people suffer from it. When we discuss, we are able to tell that at least this person has a bit of sad mood or is depressed totally. So we need to make sure that we control it. And when we're controlling it with which drugs that are not going to be harmful for conception and the baby. So, and we also, it is also room for us to counsel you that pregnancy will affect some of your diseases like asthma. Asthma can make your crisis more frequent or even reduce it. We we'll prepare you so that you, you, your, 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 your arm to face pregnancy uh, in the most optimal conditions. 
So we also offer uh, advice on vaccinations before conception, hepatitis B vaccination. We also uh, advise on treatment of other infections that may be sexually transmitted, like uh, uh, being on antiretroviral uh, treatment, because it is very important for our HIV positive clients to have uh, to have taken their drugs so much so, such that at the time of conception, their viral load is undetectable. When you take your drugs, that's what they do. They destroy, they, they prevent the, the, the HIV virus from replicating such that your at conception, it is almost not detectable in your blood. At the end, throughout pregnancy, it is the chances that you give it to your baby is very reduced and during delivery as well, during breastfeeding as well. So when we discover you at that time, before you even want to consume, we'll place you on treatment. When we'll check and we'll see that your viral is undetectable, good. We'll show that we're doing your baby the best favor that could have happened and your couple will not suffer much. Same for your, your partner. When we'll see any of these infections, if you if he, he also needs to be on treatment, we'll put both of you on treatment, herpes or uh, any of these STIs like chlamydia, gonorrhea, it is very important to treat sexually transmitted infections before you conceive. Because not only do they, do they block your tubes and making your conception very difficult, but they also make your pregnancy outcomes be very unfavorable. They give you multiple uh, abortions, they give you uh, malformations and so on. So it's important for us to treat them before you get pregnant. We also advise on the importance of uh, controlling mental health conditions. We already mentioned depression is very important. And then we also counsel on uh, fertility preservation, what many people don't talk about. But it is possible today to have a cancer and you don't want to deliver now. And you have a cancer which requires treatment that will be very heavy on your, on your ovum, on your eggs, for example. There's possibility for us to extract your eggs and freeze them. You go ahead with your treatment that will save your life. And then at the end, do it through uh, assisted procreation methods, we still use those your eggs and give you your baby. It is very possible. So when you come for counseling, depending on what we find, we will know what kind of advice to give you. It is very imperative for the couple to come. When we abandon the preconception care just to the woman, it's very heavy, especially as in our tradition, in our uh, traditional or cultural setting, most of the times when there's problem to conceive is the woman, is the woman. But it's not true. It is mixed. Most of the time it is mixed. So both of you have to come. The couple has to come for preconception care. So that's what we had for the first part, how to increase our chance of getting pregnant. Now, when we succeed to become pregnant, how do we ensure that we do all our possible best to have a healthy pregnancy and an, a favorable outcome? It's a continuation of preconception care. It is called antenatal care. All of, you, all of us know it as ANC. It's a continuation of preconception care. So it's not like you just wait and you jump, you're pregnant and you jump to ANC. You should have started with preconception care and then we just continue at, at, at uh, antenatal care. Now, WHO, uh, WHO insists or has advised that each woman that is pregnant should have, especially in a developing countries, have a minimum of eight antenatal contacts, eight antenatal care sessions. That, that's the average. Now, depending on your consult, on your condition, found at preconception care or even during the antenatal care, it may be more frequent depending on, uh, on what we find. But at the end, it's for you to have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy pregnancy outcome, a positive pregnancy experience. So during the antenatal care, what do we do? There are four big aspects of antenatal care, preventive, curative, uh, um, uh, public health information, and preparation for delivery. Those are, that's grammar. Let me put it simply, prevention, what are we doing? What are we preventing? Just like in preconception care, we are making sure that we don't have infections that will give malformations to the baby. We're already pregnant. Malformations to the baby we don't want. Abortions we don't want. Preterm deliveries we don't want. Complications of deliveries we want to avoid. So we have to make sure that we check for all those tests that are, can give us results that are disturbing so that if we can manage them, we manage them as early as possible. Now. They'll take your urine, they'll take your blood, they'll do your echographies, they'll, they'll do your malaria, they'll give you malaria prophylaxis, they'll give you mosquito nest when an endemic zone. And when, when they are doing all this, it's just to prevent 
any hitch, any complication that uh, we can have. Curative, the curative part, what are we doing? We are treating. We are treating any infection that we have seen, any problem that we have diagnosed during pregnancy that can be treated. We treat. Is it malaria? We admit. Is it urinary tract infection? We admit. Mind you, all disease on pregnancy, you have to consider them as very, very, very severe. Not only can they take your life, even that malaria that we neglect, not only can it take our lives, but also the baby will end up having families that are, sh are shattered. So we, we do treatment during pregnancy. It's important for you to take your calcium, your folic acid, your iron, and any other treatment that they give you during pregnancy. But you have to avoid auto-medication. It's very important because there are many drugs that are dangerous for babies in the first trimester, dangerous in the second trimester, others are dangerous even in the third trimester. There are some drugs, very common drugs like diclofenac that we take or ibuprofen. Profen. If you take it towards the end of your pregnancy, you will give your baby a heart, a heart defect that will be almost impossible to treat without surgery. If you take it early in pregnancy or for long, it will, will have problems with your coagulation. You will bleed a lot during pregnancy. So it's important not to do any other medication. Any disease of pregnancy, you go to a health personnel so that you are given the best care. Now, proper information concerning pregnancy, you receive it during antenatal consultation. What is the pregnancy going to look like, the duration, your expected date of delivery, what are the changes you should expect? We'll tell you that you're likely to deliver by vaginal route without a problem, but you may also have uh, incident section if that if it is indicated they will tell you before so you're not surprised so that you are financially prepared and you know that where i'm delivering delivery cost is this at the minimum but i should have extra amount one never knows an emergency can come up and i need to be operated the operation is about this so if i have this you'll be okay you have it and if they don't use it it's fine you go back home with it you have to know your blood group they'll do it during ENCs and tell you you should know it is not for you to have it in the book with you your book can get missing that's some key information you should know your blood group and then if you're of a rare group or they see that your blood level is not really high and then you may or you have chance you have tendencies of bleeding too much you may bleed too much as a preparation you have to know people who are of the same blood group as you and you tell them that i'm about to deliver or i'll deliver around this period please don't be surprised if they call you since both of us are of the same blood group to come and donate blood for me that's how you prepare for delivery and then the anticipated precautions that we take if you you have you have problems with uh, uh, hypertension during pregnancy, we know that we're supposed to give you this to prevent you from having very serious complications like preeclampsia, eclampsia that can end up with very bad things like stroke, heart failure, renal failure, and of course you lose your baby. You may even die if you don't get those lifelong complications. And then they also educate you on cooperation during labor and delivery, how it goes, how long it may take what you should do mentally to prepare yourself. All deliveries are not the same, so you don't get frustrated by this person has come and has delivered and you have not delivered. You don't take traditional things to, to start labor on your own. They are good, yes, because they accelerate labor, but at some times they also fail and cause a lot of problems and we end up losing lives for nothing. So in a nutshell, preconception care, it's important. And then when we finally are able to get pregnant, we continue with our antenatal care with a lot of seriousness because we are carrying a precious life in our bodies so that at the end, God will bless us with a healthy outcome. So as a conclusion, we will just end up by saying that preconception care is everyone's affair. It's not just a woman's affair. It's not just grammar that people who have learned big book who sit in hospitals and are waiting to bore you with. They're actually designed to help us be men, all of us who are life givers, the fathers who are the people without whom we cannot get pregnant. So that at the end we have pregnancies when we want and then have God willing a, a, a favorable outcome. So preconception care is everyone's affair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chukan. Thank you so, so much. Wow. I've learned so much today. I love the part that you said, is he trying to get pregnant for the first time? It's not about, because we always talk about the woman, the woman trying to get pregnant, the woman, but I mean, the pregnancy whole, the whole pregnancy process is not just for the women. 
it's for the couple, it's for the two of them. The two of them are trying to get pregnant, not just one person. It's really something that we need. I mean, this preconception awareness talk is so powerful. I mean, anybody that is here would say that they have learned something new. I, I for one, I did not know that it, there's something like preconception care you have to go to. You just feel that when you get married, the next thing you just start trying to get pregnant. And again, you talked about targeted sexual intercourse, not being encouraged. It's really true because you, you start putting yourself under anxiety, under pressure, and all that will make, I mean, it stops, it, it gets to regulate. I think we have to enjoy. We enjoy the process and you get blessed with, with the, 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 the cute blessings that you have, not just, oh, we be welcoming our third speaker. She will be talking, Dr. Jackie, that's her name. She will be talking all about family planning and ways to prevent unwanted pregnancies. Before she comes up, I want us to know who this doctor is, what her portfolio is all, all about. Her name is Dr. Jacqueline Fokun. She's an associate level consultant for consultant francophone countries with, with the country engagement where she provides programmatic, strategic, and administrative support for the francophone regional portfolios. In the last four years, in the last four years, with a strong blend of clinical and public practices, she has been at the forefront of adolescent and youth health, sexual and reproductive health, family planning program design. So she's not, she, she, she's somebody that has worked in this family planning field for a very long time and done a lot of studies as far as family planning is concerned. It's implementation, advocacy, it's policy evaluation, reformation, and fundraising to be able to uh, make sure that we have something like family plan planning. She's also the CEO of Youth to Youth. She has participated in a number of prestigious fellowships, like the Mandela Washington Fellowship, which she participated in 2021. There, she co-designed a family planning curriculum for African and Caribbean immigrants, teachers, and women in Philadelphia. This is this she she, she this is not the only uh, foundation a fellowship she has she has had to study under. She has so many of them that she has been studying. She says she's a medical doctor, which and she graduated from the faculty of medical and biomedical science in University of Yaoundé One. So I don't know if she's ready yet, Dr. Jacqueline. Um, okay. It's such a pleasure to join you all um, this evening. Um, it's really been great listening to Dr. Waima and Dr. Tukam. Dr. Tukam, your presentation has really been great. It reminded me a lot of things that I learned that I've forgotten. So thank you so much for such a very um, elaborate uh, yet very informative uh, session. So I'm going to talk about family planning here, but I'm really just going to uh, zap through. Uh, so we'll be, I'll be talking about family planning and, you know, just like the two pre uh, previous presenters did highlight, um, planning for a pregnancy is, is a very important thing to do and it has a good so a very long way to um, to have an impact on the outcomes of every pregnancy, and that's why we are talking about uh, family planning today. So, living in a world where population is really growing very fast, we are at um, have we reached eight billion people? Well, close to that if we haven't yet, but very close to that. And it should have different people who have different opinions about population. I'm actually not. I'm not anti-population, anti-population growth, but um, to me, it's just, okay, how do we manage the population? How do families and how do couples or just individuals plan and decide when and how many children they want to have and if at all they want to have children? So 
So by family planning here, we're really just talking about what we human beings do to determine uh, the when we want to have children, how to space children, if at all we want to have children, how many children that we want to have. So that's essentially uh, what family planning is. And we're going to see the different, uh, the objectives of family planning, like uh, I, I, the person who introduced me did mention, it's really to we avoid unwanted pregnancies. Um, the time that I worked in clinical practice, because actually now I don't do clinical practice anymore, I was always really heartbreaking to, to find maybe a teenager who is 16, who comes to the hospital and is pregnant and does maybe know that they are pregnant or who tells you that now that they are pregnant, their uncle's wife is going to send them back to the village. They were IDPs in Bermuda and really just, uh, they are in form five planning to ride a GC, they're coming and they're six months pregnant. And they're like, okay, my uncle's wife is going to send me back to go with my poor mother in the village where there, uh, there are no schools or to have a married woman maybe who has a baby that is eight months old, eight months old and comes into your to your consultation and say doctor you know what i'm coming from abortion i didn't want this pregnancy so what this is really where family planning comes in to help women avoid their pregnancy help women to decide when they want to have a child so that it's not by accident help women and even couples as a whole to, to, to space, decide the spacing between their children if they want to have children after every two years, after every three years, really depending on what they want. Um, so really being able to control the time and to determine the number of children that they want to have. So, so and I do family planning mentored would be one that is really widely accepted. It's not too expensive, so it's affordable. It's not complicated to use. When you use it, it does not have side effects. And that you really don't need a lot of support to use it. But we know that there is, I have once heard someone say, there's nothing that human beings do that uh, is without a side effect, which means that anything that we have produced, anything that human beings have produced, always have another side to it. So be the cars and the phones, anything that we use that we produce. So that's so there's no ideal family planning method because whatever you're doing, you will have uh, advantages as well as its disadvantages. So for each circumstance for you to wear now, based on the circumstance, based on your situation, based on your current state of health, your economic um, status, your social status, what would work best for you. So um, now we are just going to see what really guides, what should guide you to choose your family planning method. So with the different methods that exist, you want to look at the efficacy. How is this method? Like how efficient is it? There are some methods so very soon we're going to see that, that are, efficient at 99.9% .9 efficiency, which means that the chance of you getting pregnant are really slim as, as slim as 0.02%. Others that the failure rate is as high as, uh, like the efficiency is less than 80%, which means that uh, there's a high chance uh, for failure, some that even fail up to 40%. So depending on the efficiency, the convenience, if I'm a young, a young girl, I live with my parents, if I put an implant that they can see how convenient is it for me. So the convenience, the duration of, if I just want to space, maybe for a duration of, I want to be pregnant within six months, what method can I go in for? So based on the duration of actual, is it reversible? Uh, how could it affect uh, my uterine bleeding? As some different women will respond differently. How affordable is it? Does it also protect against sexually transmissible diseases? If there are some women who have multiple sexual partners or some men who have multiple sexual partners, in that case, which method would be good for them? Teenagers and young people, most of their sexual intercourse, the, 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 the sexual activities that I have are spontaneous. 
and they can tend to see more people. So which method is good for them? So, um, so just briefly on the different types of family planning methods that we have, we have hormonal uh, family planning methods and non-hormonal methods, and we're just going to look into uh, this family, these different methods. And then if you have any specific question, we'll not really dive into the depths, but really just mention it so that you know that on the hormonal, uh, we have pills, uh, pills that women take um, every day that are different from, uh, there's also the emergency, uh, emergency contraceptive pill, which falls under hormonal pill. So it has hormones inside. Uh, and then there are other family planning methods that really don't have hormones in them. So we, we like we are going to see the different traditional methods, barrier methods like condom, intrauterine devices that they insert in the woman's uterus, or just permanent methods like um, vasectomy for men and then for women, uh, as they say locally, the tying of their tubes. <clears throat> so, um, and this, this, this diagram here, it really just categorizes the different family planning methods based on, based on how effective they are. So you find that one of the most effective, the most effective methods are both here. So you have implants, uh, which are, we have like um, in Cameroon, we have different, we have the Jardel that they insert on the woman's arm, the inner forearm. You have uh, the IUDs, which are inserted. The IUDs, some of them have hormones inside. There's another uh, generation that does not have hormones. So really depending on, um, like uh, Dr. Tokam was mentioning, depending on your, 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 your health history, if you have hypertension, you have other diseases that uh, being on the job that has hormones might uh, not be a good thing. So you will guide now with which kind of um, family planning method you take. So there are options. So really depend, every woman should have at least an option that can, can work for them. You have the uh, female sterilization, which is the time of the tubes. You have vasectomy for men. So these are the, one of the, the most effective methods. Immediately after these methods, you have the injectables. Injectables happen to be one of the, uh, is a method that most women go for. We have injections that they take after every three months, which for some reason, most women tend to go uh, with that. You just need to make sure you maintain your rendezvous. You know when you're supposed to go for your next injection. <clears throat> you have uh, another method, this slam method, which is just a method that talks about a woman, a woman who breastfeeds exclusively within uh, the first six months of her pregnancy. So she's not giving the baby water. She's not giving the baby formula. So she's just breastfeeding the baby. And so if she breastfeeds the baby, does exclusive breastfeeding, it serves as a family planning uh, for the duration of six months, not beyond that. So you have the daily pills that they take, you have uh, patches, you have vaginal rings. Um, on that, that, we have uh, condoms and diaphragms. Diaphragms, uh, like you can see on this image, is really just a method that a woman inserts into her cervix. So through the vagina and blocks the cervix a few hours uh, to sex. Uh, some people recommend it for 18 hours, or maybe slightly less than a day before sex and then uh, a couple of hours after sex as well, and then after which it has been removed. We have the female condoms. Um, we have fertility awareness methods, which is really the natural methods here where you, a woman can be looking into her, her calendar to, to calculate when she ovulates. Uh, she can also measure her body temperatures to see during ovulation, the temperature of a woman slightly elevates but now you really have to be very keen. Um, someone who is very keen and who pays attention to details that you wake up in the morning, have a particular hour that you measure your temperature and you do and you take record in a way and you record it down so much so that when it's your time of ovulation, there's a slight increase, um, uh, the slight body uh, temperature increase, which uh, signifies so some women use that to be able to tell when they ovulate, but also not that that's strict and that's why the, the the success rate is not as high as other methods. 
Uh, we know other methods like uh, the withdrawal method, which uh, young people tend to use a lot, but which has um, quite a number of, which is not very, um, very efficient because the failure rate is uh, comparatively uh, very high and really depends on the, the ability of the other partner, especially the male partner, to be able to pull out before uh, they ejaculate, which we know that that can be um, very tricky. And that's why it's not very, um, the failure rate tends to be uh, relatively higher compared to the other methods. So um, I know that within a certain, there, there are different things that people really say, religious, uh, our religious stands, uh, cultural backgrounds, a lot of misconceptions around family planning. But like at the beginning, Dr. Uh, Nuela did project the maternal mortality ratio in Cameroon, which is really still, which is really high. And even someone comment, commented on that, that this is really high. One of the reasons why women die, we lose women, is because of <clears throat> poor planning of pregnancies. They get pregnant and maybe the conditions of their pregnancy are really not good and they don't have proper care. And then um, the pregnancy complicates the die. Or they take in while they are not prepared for it. And then they go for an abortion. You know, abortion in Cameroon is not legal. And so they go to the wrong places and then they, we end up losing them. And many of them, they are dying in their numbers. But still yet you find people um, say that, oh, don't take family planning. If you take family planning, you will not be able to conceive again. You find these myths that are say, oh, you're a young woman, you've never had a child again, you should not take family planning. These are misconceptions, these are myths that are being pushed in our community and young people espouse it. And then you find a young child or a young girl, she's in upper C, she takes in, and now her education, her life comes to an end. She's been sent home. She, some of them have been thrown out of their homes. Some of them, it means life changes for them them completely. They'll never have the opportunity again to graduate from school. Whereas maybe just knowing about emergency contraception that maybe after an unprotected sex, rushing into a pharmacy and buying a drug within, uh, um, within uh, 72 hours, there's even another one that they can take within five days, which that one is a little bit expensive, but that you can find a drug within three days that can, can really solve her problem and that she will not have to bother again. She'll still be able to have it future. Um, so we, are, I'm really just hoping that with those who are here and who are following this program can be champions of family planning to talk about family planning in a positive way because we've seen what family planning does. I'm not anti-population growth. When I was growing up, I really wanted to have 10 children, you know, but uh, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to do that anymore. But just to say that uh, it's really about how we plan, really being able to to, 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 to know when to have, when one can conceive, how to space children and encourage these young girls. Young girls who are not, like who are in the university, most of them are sexually active. Very few are not, most of them are sexually active and they are sexual, they should protect themselves. So young girls, they advise them to go with a double method. They take one family planning method plus a condom to prevent both STIs and a pregnancy because we know that the habits that they have, they tend to be uh, more sporadic with the assessment that they can have multiple sexual partners who can expose them to sexually transmitted diseases. And then later on, they can have uh, conception uh, problems uh, in the future. So I'm going to, to stop here now, just hoping that you have questions. Please feel free to share them in the chat box because I can see that we're already a few minutes to nine. Next question, I think this goes to Dr. Jackie. Someone said, if you are a young girl living with your parents, living with your parents and you're using a family planning method, it means you are ready to have a family of your own. Just leave them and go and start your own family. My point is dependent children should be educated to focus on their education rather than suggest and provide family planning method for them. Family planning as its name should be for those with families. Hmm. Doc? Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can see 
to to come is smiling uh, i'm very happy that that was raised yeah the name family planning can be misleading right so another name for family planning is contraception and at the beginning i was saying what what it does so the one thing i think that's one of the cultural uh i think our culture cultural sensitivities where we say young people if you're independent you should not literally we're saying they should not have sex how great that would have been that if we had okay if someone is not married or if someone does not work is still the their parent they should not be sexually active they should not get pregnant but the question now is with all the educational all families give to their children churches different religious groups tell teenagers or young people about sex are young people still having sex I would like us to answer in the chat box. Do we think that young people between, young people after the age of, especially 15 to 19, that they are sexually active? Are they or they are not? What, what has been your experience? Are we seeing some of them pregnant? I work in PMI for Mendel for three years, and especially with the crisis, I was shocked to see the number of teenagers who were showing up for antenatal clinic. So, you, so you, with, with public health or doing medicine, and what we do is it's not about, we, we have grown up in these communities. We know our people, we have a sense of cultural value. But what we do is that we see problems and we solve them. We don't try to use methods that don't work. Telling young people not to have sex have not worked. Young people will have sex and they will always have sex. You want to give them complete education. Because when, when you keep some information from them, they are going, their friends are going to inform them what to do. They are going to tell them that you can, you can have sex and drink a fofo and then you will not be pregnant. That's what their friends will tell them. And that's what they will do. Is it not preferable that, okay, I tell that you're my child or you're my niece. I will really encourage you to wait so that your priorities are in order. Go to school now, focus so that you're not distracted. Graduate, you can find a good man, a good man and get married. As a teenager who had an unwanted pregnancy and how he affected it. How do we solve that this contraception? For me to have my teen, my niece to keep hitting her head and saying, I don't have sex, don't have when I know that she might have sex even against her will that she, she it just takes something little for her to have sex. I also tell her, oh mommy, you should know about family plan, you should know about condom. You should not allow a boy to have sex with you without using condom. You should know that there's emergency contraceptive pill. Let them have all of that information so that when they have to, they should at the end make healthy decisions. If they have the sex, they should know what to do to prevent unwanted pregnancy. Unwanted pregnancy should not be a punishment for having unprotected sex for teenagers that they are not. Now you're talking about teenagers, even, okay, that's one aspect to it. What about married women who will come and, and they are requesting for an abortion that, that didn't want this. So let's view family planning. Let's not let let's not take it within our Christian beliefs or our family views. Look at what will help our society. What will it take? What does it take for a young girl to graduate out of university? Most of them they break the cycle of poverty. If family planning can help a young girl to graduate and break the cycle of poverty for herself and for her family, then it's a great thing. So let's give them the complete education. Um, that's what I can say, but. I think Dr. Nuela can, we can continue having this discussion on other, uh, another time, but thank you very much for asking. Wow, Doc. I know if you start talking about pre, um, family planning, yeah, you never stop because I know you're so passionate about this. So please, family, um, these um, contraceptive methods are things which we need to make it known 
<clears throat> we are health personnel and we have to pass out the information rightly. It's not about anybody's belief or anybody's culture or your religion. We need to pass out the message because I'll really uh, go in line with her because I had just, I think two weeks ago, I had uh, a girl of 14 years old who came pregnant with her mother. I asked this girl that what happened and I asked the mother that where, where did she go wrong or what happened that this she said she never she could never believe that this her daughter is sexually active that's what she told As me. I, I didn't know so it, it's something where it, it's not for us our tradition we don't tell them about it and when they get pregnant you start shouting at the kids and you start uh, so it's important we give them this information thank you very much dr jackie Thank you all so, so much for the time we have spent. Thank you for the speakers. Thank you for every information you have given out. Thank you very much. Okay, please, um, before we leave, I'd like us to, to know that Dr. Jackie, working together with uh, Nang, they have come up with an app called Nang. So you can, N-A-N-G, you can check it on the chat box. So it's there, it's, a, it's an app which you can download on Play Store. There you can get in contact with a doctor concerning family planning, your sexual and reproductive health rights. So this is an app which she actually developed and we are really happy to have her here. Thank you very much.